Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on building fast, scalable app monitoring with open source. My name is Robert Hodges. I'm CEO of Altinity, and I'm joined today by Roman Kavernenko from Victoria Metrics. We are going to be uh, doing this webinar today, uh, taking about an hour to walk through uh, different approaches in building monitoring systems using different types of databases. Uh, before we jump in and let Roman uh, start with the actual content, I'd like to tell you just a couple of things which will help you enjoy this webinar more. One is that we are recording it. And for everybody who signed up, we will send you a link to the recording as well as the slides for this webinar. You'll get those probably within about 24 hours after the webinar is done. Uh, so you don't have to take frantic notes. It's all going to come to you through email. The second thing is that we have a couple of ways that you can answer questions or ask, excuse me, uh, pose questions. You can stick them in the question and answer box, which is provided by Zoom. Uh, we'll answer them as we have time. And uh, you can also stick them in the chat. So don't be shy. Just whatever is convenient, toss them in and we will uh, 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 we'll answer them. With that, uh, let me just introduce myself and then I'll turn it over to Roman. So I'm Robert Hodges again. Uh, my background, I'm a database geek. I've been working on databases since 1983. And uh, my day job is I'm CEO of Altinity, uh, but I do a lot of, still do a lot of work uh, with databases, including webinars like this one. So uh, Roman, uh, over to you. Yeah, hello everyone. My, my name is uh, Roman Havronenko. I'm a distributed systems engineer and I'm also a big fan of monitoring and observability topics. And also I'm an engineer and co-founder of uh, Victor Metrics, uh, ESDB and monitoring solution. And um, I uh, welcome everyone uh, on this webinar and I hope you will find it useful. So, um, Let's begin with uh, with what is actually uh, application monitoring. So before that, uh, we need to answer the question: Why would someone need a monitoring? So let's imagine a situation that you are running a service, uh, user facing service, and out of sudden, your users started to receive the errors, and you ask yourself why. And then you go for more specific questions like um, when they started to receive those errors or um, how many actually users receiving those errors or how many errors is there? Like maybe it's only one error or maybe which uh, region or country was affected. And when you have answers to those questions, it's, it is really helpful to uh, find the culprit of the issue and fix it as fast as possible. Okay, so um, for me, it is no doubt that uh, monitoring is a super useful thing. And if you want to run something reliable and stable and predictable, you need to have a monitoring. So what it takes uh, to have monitoring, uh, how to make it work? Well, basically for this, you need uh, only three things. The first one is the question, is the right question to ask, for example, like, um, in which country my users are getting errors or how, um, how exactly many errors they are getting? That's the, the question. The second thing is the information which contains the answer to your question. Because for example, if you don't have any information about users per country or per region, you can't answer the question or uh, can't answer the question at which regions they are getting errors, right? And the third thing is the respondent. That's something which can access this information and answer to your questions. Okay, um, systematically, it looks uh, like this. In the middle, you have um, some uh, blue thing, <laughs> which accepts whys from you. Uh, it gets access to information, does some processing, and uh, provides you a response. If you want a metaphor, uh, it is something like a, a mysterious wizard, uh, which has access to the wisdom, and uh, it can answer. It, it knows uh, this wizard knows everything, but he will respond to you only if you get the correct answer to ask. And um, there are actually many uh, wizards 
out there and you as a hero before you begin your journey uh, you need to pick wisely which wizard will help you in your in your journey because there are two young wizards or maybe two old wizards or uh, some wizards could be even too pricey for continue your journey with them but there is always a uh, just right wizard which will help uh, you in your specific case so um and if you find if you found your wizard uh to choose it wisely um it will provide you correct answers uh to your questions answers which would help you to reach your goal in building stable and reliable uh, applications and systems okay uh, let's get back to reality from the metaphors uh so the blue thing in the middle is actually a tsdb which stands for time series database Time series databases are usually used by monitoring systems. And this monitoring systems usually has uh, their ways to collect metrics, put them into time series database for processing. And then they have query API or interface where you as an actor or as a hero uh, can ask your questions and get uh, meaningful responses. Okay. Um, in these sections, I will uh, provide more information about Victoria metrics, and maybe at some point uh, it will become your wizard in your uh, journey. So, what is Victoria metrics? Victoria metrics is an open source time series database and monitoring solution. Uh, it can vertically and horizontally scale. It means you can build a large cluster of Victoria metrics to process hundreds of uh, millions of data points per second. Uh, it also it is also really simple to operate uh, because we put a lot of work uh, to make it simple to run. It is cost efficient. It is uh, Prometheus compatible, uh, which makes it um, really useful to operate with um, all the tools which are compatible with Prometheus as well. And it is open source. It is uh, free forever, and there are no implications for you to start using it right now. Okay, uh, when to use Victor metrics? Well, basically our users uh, mostly uh, use it for Kubernetes monitoring, for hardware or infrastructure monitoring, for APM, IoT, edge computing, alerting, anything which has relation to metrics actually. And um, as I said, Victor metrics as, is a monitoring solution, which means it has a built-in TSDB in the middle it has a user interface uh, query interface um, for uh, for you to ask questions and get responses and it also has uh, its way for uh, metrics collection it can um, collect metrics via pool model from from your application or infrastructure or it can accept metrics from your applications uh, via push model okay but what is actually a metric in this scheme so metric is um, some numeric measure or observation of something for example like number of served requests or number of received errors or request lat latency or um, cpu usage of my laptop or maybe a number of uh, participants in this webinar is also a metric and when you have these metrics you can then ask uh, specific questions like um what was the total number of participants during this uh, one hour of the webinar and it is a useful information <laughs> okay um, metric structure is also uh, really simple so metric can uh, consist of metric name and metric name is something for humans to read for humans to understand and it uh, contains a meaning so when i read request total um, i can understand that probably this metric measures the number of served requests and to better understand uh, what this metric does there is a meta information which adds even more context to it so i can say that um, we serve a request with status code 200 and request with status code 403 and then value shows us how many requests we serve with these codes so i can say that we served 10 requests with code with status code 200 and then you have a timestamp that's a specific moment of time when this observation uh, was taken and was true. Okay, so 
how we store this metric metrics. Um, uh, you see the example on the screen and it contains various metrics. Uh, some of them are with um, meta information, with labels, and some of them uh, contains no meta information, uh, but they are all different. And in the same time, Victoria metrics um, inside in the data model is schemaless. There is no notion of schema, no notion of table, no notion of database. It basically stores everything you put in it. So a user is free uh, to update metrics whenever he or she wants. That also means that um, update or change metrics is very simple because you need to make a change only in your application and you don't need to apply any changes to your database, to your TSDB. You don't need to keep backward compatibility or anything else. So it's really simplify the things. Okay, and uh, how we store these metrics. So if we uh, check this metric structure from the previous slide, we can convert it to something like a, a sample stable on this slide. And despite the fact that Victor Metrics doesn't have a notion of a table or a database or something like that, we still benefit from the columnar approach for storing data. So basically we store value, timestamp, series ID in a separate columns. And we can benefit uh, from this columnar approach because we can apply uh, different processing techniques for these columns. We also have different compression codecs uh, for these columns. So um, timestamp uh, can be compressed with del double delta encoding and value can be compressed with uh, modified gorilla compression algorithm which provides a lot of benefits um, if you want to get more details about how vector metrics is designed uh, and what principles and how it is similar which ideas uh, architectural ideas it shares with clickhouse please um, check the talk which our CTO gave uh, at OSA con to 2021 uh, where he shared uh, a lot of insights about internal internal vector metrics and also some ideas that he used uh, in vector metrics were then also used by ClickHow so I, I really like this collaboration um, and all this Technical details helps uh, Victoria metrics to be efficient. So for example, the compression um, compression ratio reaches 0.4 bytes per sample. Uh, ingestion speed is around 300,000 samples per second per CPU core. And the scanning speed is also astonishing. It's like 50 million samples per CPU core. Along with clustering and horizontal scalability, it gives you basically infinite storage for uh, time series processing. Okay, and a few words about um, metrics collection approaches. So one of the approaches we uh, Victor Metrics inherited from Prometheus called pool model. Uh, with this approach, monitoring system or Victor Metrics uh, collects uh, metrics from application on its own. So application doesn't know about um, monitoring system existence. Only monitoring system knows what it needs to monitor. So uh, once per interval, it goes to the application and collects metrics from that. Uh, this approach is very useful and is very robust, but uh, Victoria Metrics also support push model. That's a more classic uh, approach to deliver metrics where application and decides when it wants and it, at which volume to deliver metrics to the monitoring system. And for the push model, we actually support a lot of the ingestion protocols. So we have integration with Prometheus Remote Write API. We have um, data doc integration, InfluxDB, Graphite. You also can push data in JSON or CSV if it would help to uh, keep your application simple for metrics delivery. Um, and a third part of monitoring system is a query API. So uh, Victoria Metrics doesn't support SQL language. It supports uh, its own uh, query language called MetricsQL. And in recent talk um, at OSACON 2022, I gave 
uh, I talk uh, named specifics of data analysis in time series database. And I try to explain in this talk why Victor Metrics doesn't support SQL or why SQL isn't a best choice for time series data. So if you are interested, uh, please feel free to check it. Maybe you find it useful. But still, I want to give some examples about how uh, metric scale works. So you see three examples of getting data back from the uh, Victor metrics. The first query just requests all the metrics with the name request total, and we get uh, two time series in response. The second query uh, requests only those time series which has uh, status code 200. So yeah, you just easy, uh, just as easy as is. <laughs> you specify code in curly braces, and you filter your results. And the third query uh, does an aggregation. It it summarizes um, all time series with name request total and groups them by label path. So as simple as is. Okay, um, demo time. So um, in the demo, I will try to show you how to run vector metrics um, and how to put some data into it and get it back to plot um, on the graph. So here I have a um, folder where I already downloaded vector metrics binary uh, from the GitHub. You also can have um, Docker images of vector metrics and let's just uh, run it. So we started vector metrics and it is working. Now let's uh, try to put some data into it. So I have a um, really simple script here, which, um, which runs in a loop from one to 100. And what it does, it actually executes a CRL command, uh, which sends in a post request with this payload. And this payload contains a metric with name HTTP request, with meta information uh, of path, like slash home. And it sends this data every five seconds. Okay, cool. So how we uh, get this data back uh, or, or just check that it is actually written. So when Victor metric starts, it um, says that um, it exposed, a, a started a HTTP server on this address. So let's visit it and uh, we get a response from the Victor metric server. And what we are looking here is VMUI, which is web user interface for, um, for getting metrics and visualizing them. So uh, we are writing metric called um, HTTP requests. So let's just type it and execute the query. Okay, and we get a response of uh, our metrics that we are writing. So. Um, Let's get last five minutes instead of last 30 minutes because we just started to write it. And we see our metric, our metric, which is incremented once every five seconds. And yeah, and here we have a legend which shows that we got only one metric in response, HTTP request with our path. And um, yeah, so we, we got the metric back and we can do right things with that. But actually this metrics is kind of boring because it, it, there is no much sense behind it. It doesn't give you any insights. It just artificially generated metric. Uh, so uh, when we started the webinar, I, I, was, I started also collecting metrics from my laptop, metrics like CPU usage or memory usage or network usage. And I'm doing it via open source uh, collector called Node Exporter, which is widely used uh, across uh, many, many installations and environments around the world. Basically, any probably any data center you know running Node Exporter for collecting metrics. And let's try to see what is uh, my um, CPU usage. Uh, during this webinar. So for this, I know that there, uh, there is a metric called node CPU seconds total. From its name, it's um, easy to say that it probably contains uh, CPU usage um, in terms of time spent by, by CPU for doing work. And if we execute it, we get um, some lines plotted here. And legend suggests us that there are multiple time series in return and this time series are different by CPU number. So probably uh, I have two CPUs because I run this uh, exporter in the Docker and Docker thinks it has access only to two CPU cores. 
And also it has a context of mode. So mode shows us uh, in which mode CPU is used. And looking on this graph, we see that uh, most of the lines are flatlined, but only one, uh, one type of mode is actually climbing up. And it is mode idle, which probably means that we are, uh, my CPU is doing nothing. <laughs> Uh, it is in idle mode. So let's try to filter everything by this mode idle. Okay, and we get this two metrics in response. If, if we check, it is um, uh, mode idle for two CPU cores. Okay, uh, since uh, this metric shows us a accumulative counter, uh, which only cleans up, to get the per second change uh, of the CPU usage, the, the one that you are used to see in utilities like htop or activity manager we need to apply extra function called rate which calculates per second change of the metric and with this function we can now say that uh, we are likely spending like 99 percent of the time uh, in the idle mode we can also multiply it by 100 to make it a real percents so 99 percent uh, is spent uh, on doing nothing uh, with my CPU, but that's not all. Uh, not all. With um, uh, with this open source um, exporter for metrics, you can get actually much more powerful powerful results because there are many people who are using this exporter, and they also developed a lot of tools which could be helpful for you. And this is the beauty of open source and compatibility uh, features. So as I said, this exporter is very popular. And if you go to grafana.com dashboards, you can find that dashboard for this uh, specific exporter is the most popular dashboard across uh, all other dashboards. And it has like 22 millions of downloads. So let's check if we can use this dashboard. So. Uh, I also have downloaded Grafana and I will just run it right now and let's see if we can get some useful information from it. So I go to Grafana, which is running default on local um, on local host uh, port 3000 and try to uh, import this dashboard. Okay, it's almost done and it suggests uh, to select a data source. And I already configured data source to point to my um, Victoria metrics that we launched a few minutes ago. And we import this, uh, import this dashboard. And we see that we get some data. Of course, we don't have 24 hours of data because we only uh, spend 20 minutes on this webinar. So let's get last 15 minutes. And yeah, here's what you get with the power of open source. You have CPU usage, you have memory basic usage, network usage, disk space usage, and a lot of additional metrics and visualizations that you get just for free uh, because of the compatibility and power of open source. I hope this uh, will be useful uh, to start. Okay, um, and let's get back to presentation. There is one more slide that I wanted to show is um, uh, frequently asked questions uh, you might have about exometrics and can I monitor my SQL Server, Postgres or any other thing? Uh, probably yes, because uh, there are many, many open source uh, exporters for almost every uh, popular software. You can have exporter for ClickHouse, you can have exporter for Redis, you can have exporter for Nginx, and you will find alerting rules for them, Grafana dashboards, a lot of recommendations how to use them. So yeah, they are all free and all available in the internet. Another question, can I monitor my applications? Of course you can. Uh, there are also a lot of instrumentation libraries which you can use uh, with different programming languages and to instrument your application to expose any metrics you want. How expensive monitoring is? Well, um, I did a napkin math uh, for collecting metrics from 100 instances. Each instance emits about uh, 1000 metrics every 30 seconds. And uh, for that, we will need like 100. Um, and these metrics need to be stored for one year. 
and to store this for one year to collect all these metrics for one year we will need like about 100 gigabyte of disk space and it will cost us 54 dollars per year and we also need to rent the test remedium aws instance which will cost us around 360 dollars per year so in total you need to spend like $400 per year for monitoring this 100 instances. So that's the cost efficiency. And the last question, can I run Victor metrics in Kubernetes? Of course, we have Helm charts and Kubernetes operator and nothing stops you from just uh, launching it with one command. Okay, that was my part and thank you for listening. I now pass mic to, to Robert. All right, thank you very much. Let me try the, uh, oh, uh, so uh, there's a question here in the Q&A box. How does Victoria metrics protect itself from metrics that introduce extreme cardinality labels? And I'm gonna bring a, work on bringing up my slides while you answer that. Okay, yeah, that's a really good question because it's a um, uh, really big, big problems in monitoring and it's called a cardinality explosion. And for that, we have a protection on our collecting agents, uh, which can limit the number of uh, unique time series per time window per uh, hour or per day. And when this limit is reached, uh, these collecting agents start to reject uh, these metrics. We internally use Bloom filters to register new time series over time periods. And this helps us to protect uh, the main, uh, main database from these cardinality explosions. So there are handles, there are limits you can apply uh, to your clients and it will protect you from this kind of issue. Great. I, uh, if there are more questions, feel free to, to, to put them in the Q&A box as well as the chat. I believe we're gonna have some time. In fact, I'm sure we'll have some time at the end and we can cover them. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to talk about using ClickHouse for building monitoring systems. So uh, Roman, can you just confirm you can see my screen okay? Yeah, I do. Great, okay, let's dive in. So ClickHouse, it's not a time series database. What is it? It's a real time analytic database. And what that means is it's designed to, well, we'll go into the architecture a little bit. It's designed to get very, very fast responses on very large amounts of data. Uh, some key characteristics. First of all, it understands SQL. So it's coming from, you know, sort of a different database tradition from time series databases, but like Victoria metrics, it is open source. In the case of ClickHouse, it's Apache 2.0. It's a general purpose database. So it handles many use cases, everything from valuing financials to driving security, uh, monitoring systems to uh, log management. But it also happens to handle time series data very well because most of these large, in fact, almost all large data sets tend to be time ordered in some way. And in fact, uh, for many of them, time is the most important property. So as a result, it's quite useful for building monitoring systems along with all these other use cases. Let me just talk about a few of the uh, characteristics of ClickHouse that make it useful for, uh, for quick response on, on large data sets. So there's three things that I think are interesting uh, to mention. Uh, first of all, ClickHouse, like virtually all uh, other high performance analytic databases uses column storage. So it's highly compressed. Uh, uh, every If you look at a table, all the uh, data is for each column is stored in, in a single set of files. Um, they are highly compressed and the uh, table itself is indexed in various ways. There's a primary key index, which can allow you to, to uh, recognize and locate certain parts quickly, but it also has skip indexes. And in fact, there are even inverted indexes have just been added and are now available. So this highly compressed uh, columnar storage uh, reduces IO and makes it possible to scan enormous amounts of data with relatively uh, low amounts of resources. The second thing is that when we're querying ClickHouse, uh, ClickHouse is extremely good at parallelizing. So across hosts, this picture here shows three tables on three different hosts, but it also parallelizes extremely well within a host. So basically when you run ClickHouse, if you allow it to do so, it will use every core on your, um, 
on your system. And if, of course, you know most cores have uh, have hardware threads that will use all the threads, it will basically use 100% of the CPU resources. So this allows us to get very, very fast answers to questions by just throwing a lot of hardware at it. And then a final really important part of the architecture is that ClickHouse provides automatic replication between nodes. In fact, uh, sharding and uh, replication are built in parts of the system. And so it's possible to have data sets that extend to a, that have multiple replicas for each part of the data set or each, each chunk, if you will, um, and then split the data set into many chunks or shards uh, extending across, in some cases, hundreds of machines. So that's the basic architecture. Um, another important thing about ClickHouse is it's very fast to load. Like Victoria Metrics, in fact, the met, uh, if you look at the, the performance of things like ingest, uh, speed of query, things like that, uh, it's pretty comparable to, uh, uh, to Victoria Metrics. What this means is a ClickHouse can load millions of events per second. So if you have a monitoring system that is, uh, for example, doing things for multiple tenants, in which case you have a huge amount of data, uh, because it's sort of amount of data times customers, uh, or it's a, a very large monitoring prob, uh, problem, you know, like a, a large cloud installation or installations, uh, it's very good at ingesting this. Uh, we can read from Kafka. You can easily build custom applications to put it in. And ClickHouse is also very good at reading off data lakes. This is a, a newer capability, but something that people, uh, 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 you know, lean on pretty heavily. Typically, when you use ClickHouse, what you're going to do is take that data that you're ingesting, and you're just going to put it into what's called an unaggregated um, table. And by unaggregated, we it means we don't do any pre-aggregation of the data. Just every time a record arrives, we store it as a row in the table, and uh, you can query straight off that. In some cases, it is useful because there are questions that you're answering or asking constantly that need a very, very fast answer or where you want to limit the amount of resources applied to them. It's useful to pre-compute some of the answers. In that case, ClickHouse gives you materialized views. These are basically transformations or triggers, if you will, that get invoked every time a block of data arrives in the source table. You'll run a query across it, and the results of that query will be put in the materialized view table. This is a very flexible feature and allows ClickHouse in on very large data sets uh, for predictable questions to give answers uh, in milliseconds. And another uh, key property of ClickHouse that makes it work well for a wide number of use cases, but particularly for monitoring, is it has dozens of input formats. These are just formats that are built in. You'll say insert, and this is a, a little bit different from uh, conventional SQL, but you'll say insert, give a table name, and then you give a format. And then that name can be any of the following that are shown here. You can read tab separated values in, you can read normal SQL values, which are the, the tuples that you read in. You can read what's called JSON each row data and uh, a protobuf parquet, orc, uh, you name it, ClickHouse uh, consumes it. And I would say, you know, every month there's probably another format added. It's, uh, it's uh, moving forward very, very quickly. So what this means is almost regard, you know, no matter what the form of data you have, ClickHouse, there's a pretty good chance ClickHouse is just going to be able to read it and stick in a table and you can, you can do queries on it. So final thing, uh, ClickHouse, I said, was not a time series data set or database, but because time is so important in these large, uh, in these large systems, it has a huge number of functions that allow you to store and manipulate uh, time data. So there are three commonly used uh, uh, types which are uh, can store time. Uh, there's date, uh, obviously that just uh, gets you to the day. There's date time, that's basically a Unix times or Linux or Unix timestamp, so one second precision. And then finally, there's date time 64, which can go all the way down to a nanosecond. Uh, if you're working with Grafana, uh, date time is probably your friend. That is is the one that that Grafana and some of the other BI tools are most familiar with. And, and so if you have a, a timestamp or other you know, field in the table, it means that, you're, that that table data is going to be easy to, to process with those tools. At the same time, there's a huge number of functions that will allow you to manipulate time data in various ways. I'm just giving a, a couple dozen examples here. For example, you can take any 
date time value, run it through two YYYMM, and it will just pop out an integer, which gives you the year and the month. Uh, this is very, very useful to be able to quickly transform data. Uh, you know, this is something you commonly do in queries when you're bucketing things by month. For example, you would run this uh, to YYYMM. Uh, similar things, you know, normalizing start of year, start of minute, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, so there's there's lots of stuff here. And and so almost any operation that you want to do on time, ClickHouse tends to have a way to do it and do it well. So with that background, what I'm going to do is just walk through building a simple host monitoring system. So ClickHouse is general purpose. And uh, so it really means that it can monitor anything. I'm going to go with. Uh, uh, Oh, here's a question coming up. How does one handle changes in the schema? I'm going to get to that in a second. Just hold your breath. Uh, so we'll start with just doing something simple. I'm going to, uh, probably everybody on this call is familiar with VMstat. It's a very popular uh, Linux and uh, back in the day Unix utility, and it just pops out stats on your, uh, you know, on your system. But it could be anything. You, you can, uh, you know, regardless of the problem, as long as you can find something to generate the data, you can stuff it in a ClickHouse and do fun stuff with it. So what we'll do is we're going to build a little collector, which will run VMstat and pull the data out. We're going to feed it into ClickHouse, and then we're going to uh, uh, build a Grafana dashboard to look at it. So let's do the first step. That's to generate the VMstat data. So if you're a Python fan, this won't look totally frightening, but basically what it's doing is it's opening up a process, uh, a VMstat command, and it's just uh, reading the data out. And as it turns out, I'll translate it for you, it's, it's just turning it into JSON. I don't have to do this. I could, uh, there are simpler formats, but in fact, I wanted to play around with some of the JSON transformations. Uh, so we're going to dump it as JSON, and that makes it easy to consume. What does it look like? Well, when it goes through those, what is it, uh, 13 lines or so of Python, what you get is the output in addition to the uh, to the output from VMstat. Uh, VMstat, I took the liberty of adding a timestamp and a host name, and then everything else is the VMstat uh, variables, named exactly as they appear in the in the header line. So here's three of them. So this output is being generated every second in my little app, and the next thing that we need to do is we need a table to store this. So let's design that table. Unlike Victoria Metrics, ClickHouse is SQL based. And so of course it does have schema. And that means that everything we're gonna process has to be in a table. Now those tables can be much more flexible than a conventional SQL table. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that in a minute. But for this example, it turns out that ClickHouse can just read that uh, that for that JSON format I showed you, we call that JSON each row format, and it can just stuff it straight into the columns of a table as long as those columns match the, the the JSON. And so I've designed exactly this table, and the first three things that we see here are actually what we call dimensions. So these are things that characterize the data, and then everything else in the table is measurements, kind of like the metrics that Roman just talked about a few minutes ago. And so uh, we also you know, when we're building these tables, we do a few things that that are a little bit different from SQL. If you're if you haven't used ClickHouse before, we have an engine called Merge Tree. That's a storage engine that is designed for very very, uh, very large tables. We partition the data, which tells how to break it up, and then we uh, give an ordering, which also implicitly defines what's called a sparse primary key index that allows us to find sections of data within the uh, within the table very quickly. So this is the basic uh, th this is the basic format of of the table. So we create that table, and now we can go ahead and start loading data into it. So not unlike uh, Victoria Metrics, it is very very easy to load data. Uh, so to to load my JSON data, I'm going to issue a SQL command like this, which is to insert into VMstat, and I'm going to tell it the format is JSON each row. And so ClickHouse is now ready. It's it's ready for basically for a stream of data. Um, I'm going to load this in the simplest possible way in in this example, which is that I'm going to stick the data into a uh, for this uh, you know for this illustration. I'll just stick it in a file and then I'll load it with curl. 
And so I'm going to do an HTTP post. Uh, ClickHouse has a post interface uh, or a, a, a uh, HTTP REST interface. And so I can basically load it up, run my query, and uh, that will pop the data into the table. That's all I have to do. Or if you want to do something a little bit more sophisticated, you can write a Python script. In fact, uh, for my example system, that's what I did, but that script is too long to show you here. And I want to illustrate how simple the inserts can be. There are many other ways of inserting data, but these are two common ones. Fourth thing, uh, now we can build a dashboard. So in this case, uh, I built a little dashboard and that is, um, I, the Grafana, as long as you're, you know, sort of handy with it, you can quickly, uh, you know, put together a dashboard on the ClickHouse data, ask any quick, you know, sort of show any types of things that you want to do. This dashboard here, uh, because I haven't used Grafana for about a year, it took me about 90 minutes to put it together. And we'll we'll show how that works in a, in a minute. If you're using uh, uh, Grafana with ClickHouse, I want to point out that there's actually now a couple of plugins for, uh, uh, for using uh, uh, Grafana, the most popular one by far is uh, actually what is called the ver currently called the uh, Altenity plugin for ClickHouse. It actually, its its name when you look it up is actually Vertimedia because it was originally developed by Roman, uh, my partner here in this presentation today, uh, when he was working at, at Vertimedia Media a few years ago. And when he left, he uh, transferred it over to us and we've been maintaining it ever since. There's now another Grafana plugin, which is uh, offered. Uh, uh, it's an in-tree plugin that's uh, maintained by Grafana, um, and it's also uh, in collaboration with ClickHouse Incorporated. So you can use either one of these. I use the Altenity plugin uh, because it's the one that we maintain and know well. And after loading, then you can kind of go crazy because the one of the other differences between ClickHouse and uh, a system like uh, like Victoria Metrics is that you can also do analytical data, analytical queries, which reach deep into the data and ask arbitrary questions. So, for example, if I see something, you know, if I want to, you know, ask some questions about, hey, what's the average load on my systems? Do I need to think about upgrading CPUs um, or or machine sizes, as the case may be? Uh, I might want to just do run queries, you know, across arbitrary portions of the data, do sort of slicing and dicing type operations, and these are pretty easy to do. This query, which uh, is not too complicated, is simply asking the question: In the last 24 hours, which of my hosts had a, a full minute where they averaged over 24, only over 25% load, and then just spit out those host names and the number of minutes that they were over. These are the hosts in my closet. As you can see, they're not very busy hosts. Uh, the only reason that they even appeared on this was I was running uh, some performance uh, tests to, to put interesting data into the metrics. But this is an illustration of how you can now go ahead and, and begin to add all kinds of in, you know, sort of analytical type queries where you're exploring the data to, uh, to understand it better, to make decisions about your business, so on and so forth. So with that, I'd like to show you this in operation very quickly. We'll just sort of go over the parts. And uh, here's our dashboard. Uh, but let's first look at the what's uh, going on out here. So uh, let's just have a look at the scripts that we're using to collect data. So uh, the data collection script is pretty simple. Um, it's that Python that, oops, uh, sorry, wrong one. It's called VMStat Producer. So it is just these lines of code. And in general, writing, uh, writing scripts to collect data tends to be relatively simple as long as the data is some in, in some easily accessible form, like just run a process, collect information, and spit it out as records of some kind. Similarly, uh, Consuming the data is relatively easy. I wrote for this, rather than using the curl command, I actually wrote a, a script which knows how to read this into, uh, basically take the data, those records from standard in and loads them up into uh, ClickHouse 10 at a time. This uh, Python is 
some of the worst I probably have ever written. Uh, it could probably be done in half this length, but um, I was trying to get it to work quickly. So what this does though, very simply is it accumulates the lines 10 at a time and up, up to 10. And then every time it gets 10 of them, it just pumps it into ClickHouse. And uh, these scripts then are run in, in this simple example. They're just run as follows. Uh, this uh, where we have the producer running and then it just pipes the input to the, or the output over to the, the consumer, which sticks it in ClickHouse. I basically had this script running for about a day and a half on this computer or, or, or even longer. And that's generating my, uh, my data. So that's pretty much all the fixings I had to do. I can go and see the data in ClickHouse. I just log in and I can use monitoring. And there's the table. And uh, you can see VMstat and I could run that query that I, I showed on the last slide and we would get an interesting answer out of it. So that's it. Let me just show you the, uh, just play around with the, uh, the, the, uh, the hosts, or excuse me, with the, with the Grafana uh, dashboard. So Grafana is really handy for operational metrics. Uh, it's, you know, we were talking about it before the, the call. It's sometimes a little bit cranky to use, but it's definitely very interesting for being able to recognize, you know, to build operational dashboards that you can then easily manipulate. So for example, this is the data coming off my, uh, off my, uh, the, the base feed from both of them. I'm just tracking the average CPU usage. I can see, for example, that, hey, there were some interesting things going on here. Um, what was this? Well, this was the uh, the the process the uh, system called Logos three hit a hundred percent CPU utilization at this uh, th during this time interval. So what we can do is we can build that out a little bit, and then we can actually go and select Logos three and look at the data there, and uh, you know basically see things like memory usage, see things like uh, uh, CPU, and we can recognize okay. Uh, as it turns out, I was running a performance test uh, using Sysbench, and this drove the CPU to 100%. So Grafana is very flexible. Uh, that VMstat data contains a wealth of information. I can also see amounts, uh, you know, amounts of, uh, uh, you know, sort of the memory as you see here. There's other in, uh, uh, types of metrics out there. It's pretty easy just by uh, building simple you know, going ahead and continuing to add panels to this, I can build up a pretty comprehensive set of of uh, of metrics for uh, for these Linux hosts in no time at all. So uh, that's the demo. Let me go ahead and uh, again, just to be clear, this whole system I set up in uh, something on the order of ninety minutes to two hours. It really didn't take very long to do. So uh, let's go back and just polish off uh, polish off Clickhouse. So uh, one interesting question, and this is the question that was asked specifically, how does one handle changes in the schema in the context of time series? New labels, change in label names, et cetera. That's a really important question. So, uh, and that's exactly what this slide is designed to do. ClickHouse doesn't always have to store things, everything in a column. I happen to do it that way because it was quick. If your data isn't gonna change, that's that's a good way to do it. But there's at least four other ways and, and more beyond that that you can, simulate time series behavior, which allows you to have sort of a pool of data with, with changing properties. And one of them is to take those blobs and you can actually just stick them into a column uh, where you store the JSON as a string. And what you can then do is you can materialize out a few of the columns by just pulling them out with functions, sticking them in the header of the table. If you need more information, you go dig into the JSON and get it. That's a little cumbersome. So there, there are actually some better ways to do this. Another one is to take that JSON value, like the, the JSON that I showed you, and store it in what's called a map uh, column. And a map column stores uh, key value pairs. So those would be uh, stored in the map, and then you can pull some of them out into regular conventional columns if you like. Otherwise, it's pretty easy to, it's fairly easy to run queries on the map. Uh, still another way to do it is to have what are called paired arrays. 
And basically you extract the header values into one of the arrays, and then you have the values uh, that, car they, excuse me, the, the keys into one of the arrays and the, head and the actual values are then in a matching array in the same order. And you can uh, basically run queries on that. And then finally, uh, ClickHouse uh, this year introduced uh, what's called a JSON data type, where you can take those JSON uh, documents and you can just throw them into ClickHouse and they will then, uh, ClickHouse will do its best to parse the format of the JSON and basically assign each key to uh, columns. This one is less well suited to, uh, uh, to storing very diverse types of data because uh, you tend to get relatively inefficient storage in that case, uh, you know, as they, as you get more and more, uh, you know, if you get uh, JSON, for example, that's arbitrarily nested or wide variation in the uh, types of keys that you're storing, then this, uh, this is likely to be less efficient. The effect is though that you can, uh, that you can simulate many of the capabilities you get in, in these databases and, and process this uh, time series data very well. And then more generally, uh, ClickHouse is just a general purpose uh, database, as I said in the beginning. And so it has all kinds of, of libraries uh, that allow you to do uh, uh, ELT, to do event streaming, uh, rendering display. You can run it on Kubernetes and there's, a, there's a, a bunch of client libraries. So you can build any kind of application you want. And this is where, you know, if you're looking at, uh, you know, sort of just monitoring Prometheus, Victoria Metrics is a really great choice. Um, you know, if you're looking at building something more custom, for example, doing application performance uh, metrics, where you also want to, uh, you know, combine with other data, for example, join across tables, then perhaps ClickHouse is, is a better solution. And then there's all this software to help you build it. Um, I'll skip over this, but here's where you can find out more about ClickHouse. Uh, lots of sources here. Uh, and it's a, it's a very large community uh, and very popular, like like Victoria Metrics, of course. So with that, we're getting to the end of our talk. We just have a couple of other uh, screens. Um, so just some comparisons here. And I think some of these are pretty clear. Uh, ClickHouse, uh, you can read this, uh, this slide, but you know, it talks uh, SQL stores any kind of data. Anything you put in is just a row in a table. You do use tables. It's very easy to load data with simple clients. Uh, uh, you can pull from uh, data from Kafka and object storage. The queries are very versatile, so it's it's very easy to to add, uh, <clears throat> you know, to to construct uh, to to answer very complex uh, questions, particularly if you use joins. And then ClickHouse has incredibly strong aggregation capabilities, which are very fast and very powerful. Uh, virtually all open source BI tools can talk to ClickHouse and it's fast and scalable. Uh, it, Roman, do you want to sing the praises of Victoria metrics, uh, things that you want to highlight about what it can do? Yeah, sure. So in this comparison, Victoria metrics is <laughs> also similar to ClickHouse, uh, only it doesn't talk SQL, but it talks metrics QL, prompt QL, and also we have a integration with graphite QL. So you can use graphite query language. Um, we uh, Victor Metrics is also uh, optimized for um, storing data, uh, huge volumes of data, but it is specifically time series data. And yes, Victor Metrics doesn't have a, like explicit schema. You don't need to define tables, so you just put the metrics of the structure I mentioned. Uh, Victor Metrics has integrations with different query languages for application instrument and for collecting metrics of uh, various exporters. Uh, Victoria Metrics can pull data from Prometheus uh, exporters. It has integration with Kafka, and it also um, supports the direct push uh, of the of the metrics or of the data, uh, like ClickHouse does. Um, metrics SQL is not um, that powerful in um, in the meaning of versatility like SQL, uh, but it it is much more advanced uh, for time series specific uh, things. Uh, and uh, functions related for time series um, data processing. Uh, yeah, uh, this is correct that we integrate with any BI tool which speaks from QL. And yes, we're trying to remain uh, extremely fast and scalable. That's <laughs> yeah, and I didn't even bother to put 
my performance numbers down because you had some men you mentioned you know sort of per core performance and clickhouse is pretty comparable depending on what you're doing um so yeah and one thing i should say is that like you know like what would i choose if i were building a system well both actually uh it turns out we run a cloud uh Altenia.cloud is uh, is our uh, cloud for managed ClickHouse, and uh, we use ClickHouse uh, for the custom parts of the monitoring, and we use uh, Victoria Metrics to store all our Prometheus data. Uh, so we're and we're happy with both, and don't have any plans to change that anytime soon. Yeah, I would also add that um, the difference, uh, as I uh, used to explain, the difference between ClickHouse and Victoria Metrics, or, or uh, ClickHouse and Prometheus, is that. Uh, Victoria metrics or Prometheus like systems, they are capturing uh, like a snapshot, the state of uh, your application, the state of your hardware at each specific moment of time. When ClickHouse can store uh, events, like when event happens and you record that and then you can process that. So this is the difference. Victoria metrics is for um, storing and processing the state of the system and ClickHouse can process in, can process actually anything. It can process state, it can, it can process events and yeah, so it's general purpose database. Great, and we're here to help. So uh, Roman, do you wanna tell about what Victoria Metrics does uh, for people who wanna build these systems? Yeah, sure. So uh, Victoria Metrics is mostly open source, like 99% um, of all the functionality, everything I mentioned here in the um, in the talks, except of um, graphite integration is open source, you can have single version, you have you can have cluster version, uh, open source free commercial use without any limitation. So you can build really large systems using only open source. And then we have enterprise um, part of Victoria Metrics, which um, adds some more um, security improvements or automation, uh, which usually needed for enterprise um, companies. Uh, and besides that, we, we also run a managed uh, solution for Victoria Metrics for those who don't want to bother with uh, setting up uh, something manually. So you just go to the cloud and in a couple of clicks, you get uh, ready Victoria metrics cluster or binary ready to accept your metrics and visualize them yeah so that's mostly it we have a pretty similar business model so we're uh, layered on top of of clickhouse uh, which is open source everything we do that is uh things like the kubernetes operator for clickhouse stable builds for clickhouse which are uh clickhouse builds that are have uh three years of support and are certified for production use it's all open source we run a cloud platform uh, uh, for uh, ClickHouse. We can run it both in our VPCs if you want just an endpoint and get started right away, or if you have a Kubernetes cluster or just give us access to your account on um, Amazon, for example, we can just set it up and run it there in your, uh, in your own account. We offer enterprise support for ClickHouse that's baked into the cloud offerings. And we also have a bunch of on-prem or self-managed customers. And then we do education for ClickHouse. So I hope you'll visit both, check out both of these. These are great solutions. Uh, you know, with that, thank you very much. Here's contact information. Uh, just come to our websites. You can, you can get hold of us very easily. Uh, there is a there is a question here. We'll hang around and answer questions for a bit. Uh, there's a case where uh, uh, there's in a case where one uses ClickHouse to store metrics, logs, traces. Is there an ergonomic way for data correlation? Okay, by ergonomic, I take it you mean something that's easy to do and doesn't involve uh, like massive distributed joins. I, one thing that I'll just throw out there is depending on what you're storing for the systems, a really common way to uh, uh, to handle them in ClickHouse is just to uh, stick them all in one table. So you can have log information, like log messages, uh, can coexist with data from uh, metrics data from monitoring. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. And ClickHouse has a number of features that allow you then to correlate this, this data basically through aggregation functions of various kinds. In fact, uh, I have a talk on how to do this. This is called the big table model. Uh, ClickHouse has in addition to very powerful aggregation functions, some of those functions allow you to just do this in a single scan. So uh, this is something ClickHouse is very big on is not having to 
uh, scan the data multiple time, not having to, times, not having to do self joins, uh, things like that, because they're slow, and uh, and you don't get, uh, you know, you don't get results back as quickly as possible. Depending on what else you're storing, uh, reference tables, those types of things tend to be separate tables, and you join on them. Um, uh, you know, beyond that, you'd have to look at the specific use case. If you have something that's really enormous, uh, that simply won't fit on single machines or single tables, uh, then you'll have to consider some kind of bucketing, uh, perhaps by tenant or something like that, that allows you to keep the data uh, for single tenants in a single shard, and then you can easily get to it. Question here, is the webinar recorded? Absolutely, it is. And we will be sending a copy of this um, afterwards. Uh, Roman, we're at time, so uh, at this point, uh, I think we can stick around for another minute or two. If there are other questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Uh, in the meantime, Roman, thank you for a great presentation. I I learned a bunch about Victoria Metrics that I didn't know before uh, uh, before we did this talk. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. And I, it would be a pleasure to continue. <laughs> Uh, such webinars um, if we want to dig in more details how to be, build um, a good monitoring solution because in this webinar we discussed only like basic principles at least from my side <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah there's so much more about this subject if you want to hear more contact us let us know we'll figure out a way to present it our goal here is to educate and beyond that just get out and try this stuff try both systems they're great and I. Uh, I, you know, we'll, you know, and see how it works, tell the community how it works for you and uh, contact us for help. So with that, I think we'll call it a day. Thanks again, Roman. Thank you. Thanks again to everyone who attended. It's a pleasure doing these talks and uh, stay tuned for more and we'll talk to you soon.